Hello and welcome back to Polly Plus and More Equals Us. Welcome back to the regularly scheduled program. Um, last week we did a live chat. Um, if you haven't listened to it, it is up for you to listen to or you can watch it on Spotify or YouTube. Sorry. <laughs> you can watch it on YouTube. Um, or listen on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts or on Google Podcasts or whatever it is that you're listening on right now. Um, but welcome back. We um, went on vacation to Cabo and we talked about it um, a little bit at the beginning of the live that we did last week. Um, but it was really nice. We went on, on this vacation for my birthday. Um, just to celebrate. So yay, happy birthday to me. Um, yeah, it was really nice. And then last week, instead of putting out an episode, we did a live. And as much fun as we have been having at these lives, I think we're going to put them on pause for a while because they're actually a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work on my end to get everything set up and have everything prepped and ready. And I don't know. We just don't really feel like doing it right now. So we're not. <clears throat> so going live is going to be on hiatus for a little bit. We're thinking maybe after the summer we might start doing them again. I don't know. We'll see. We will see. But for now, you're just going to get regular episodes anyway. So this week we are talking about defining belief systems. And I mean, this has to do with like basically all aspects and areas of life, not just like relationships and polyamory, but of course it, it applies to everything. So um, yeah, let's just jump right into it because it's, it's a longer episode. So let's just get right to it. Hello, so today we want to sort of continue the conversation that started um, in the live that we did last week about, so if you didn't listen to it, just a quick recap, I was talking about how in the airport there was this little girl who was maybe like four or five years old. And she looks up at her mom and she says, am I being a good girl? And her mom goes, yes, you're being a good girl. And it just sort of struck me that like, wow, this little girl already is learning to like seek validation from others outside of herself, but also in the way of like being a good girl, being what other people say is good or what society deems is good or appropriate. I don't know, just all, all that kind of stuff. And, and so we started talking about that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but we wanted to continue that conversation because I, I think it's an important one. And I think it's something that all of us sort of go through, no matter what relationship type you're in. This is more just like a, a personal thing and I, uh, something that I think everyone goes through, but it sort of can define your relationships or how you act in relationships or how, how you view them. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, we just wanted, wanted to continue with that because I feel like that was a big that was a big struggle for me. And that's something that I'm still like learning and still working on that, that conditioning of, of being what is deemed as acceptable by society rather than saying, okay, but what do I really want? So there's some specific, I guess, <clears throat> like good things that you've been conditioned to, to believe. Mm-hmm or I guess certain ways that you've been conditioned to act that you're kind of, I guess, questioning now or wanting to change? God, so many. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, where do I start? The list is so long. 
Um, the first thing that comes to mind really is just like how to live your life in general. For me, growing up, I was taught that you need to get good grades in school and then you go to college so that way you can get a great education and get a good job and then you meet somebody and you get married and you have children and you have a house and you have a car and you have all the things and that's it. And that is life and that by the time you're like 30, you have all of these things, it's all set and then you just like magically live your life till you're 60. So like what happens in those 30 years? What happens between 30 and 60? No one ever really talks about that. What do you do during that time? You just work your job like a mindless little monkey until then? What? <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of people have families and they're raising their families. and Yeah, I guess. But like, I don't know. Like, so just that <laughs> whole way of living life just, of course, it, it made sense because I was growing up in Orange County in the suburbs where, like, that's what everyone did. People who were living there, like, that was the whole reason. They were like, we're getting ready to start a family, so we're going to buy a house with a white picket fence. If any of you <laughs> have have known me or have seen sometimes when I go home, I'll post, like, a picture of my parents' house because it, it literally looks like a doll house. You know, and I, I mean, it was a great place to grow up in general, but, like, it's like this perfect little dollhouse and you have to have a white picket fence that's like mandatory. You're not allowed to not have the white picket fence out front, right? And so that's, that's how I grew up. I grew up in this little, little bubble of perfection and, and so that was like the, the model that I was given for life and then it wasn't until Maybe the beginning of college when I kind of started to realize that that wasn't exactly right for me. And I didn't know <clears throat> in, in what ways necessarily yet, but I, I just knew like, eh, I don't know if this is quite right. And so the first piece that I sort of figured out was that I didn't want kids. And as a woman, like to say that you don't want kids Everyone is always telling you, oh, you're going to change your mind. Oh, it's, you know, just wait till you're older. It's like, well, guess what? I'm older now and I haven't changed my mind. So that was sort of like the first piece for me, realizing that I didn't want kids. Um, or at least not in like the traditional sense. Um, and then obviously relationships. Um, I eventually figured that one out too that, you know, maybe monogamy isn't quite right for me. Maybe I want something different than that. Um, but then also just like who, who I am, you know, I'm, I'm really loud. I don't know if any of you can tell. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> um, but I can remember from such a young age being told like, you're too loud, be quiet. And, you know, and so that kind of starts to create this, like, these subconscious beliefs that, like, it's not okay to take up space, right? Because even, like, your voice being loud, that's, that's, that's you. That's sending out, sending out your voice, sending out who you are to the world and being told that that's too much. You need to bring it back in. You can't be too loud. You can't be too much. That's that's not okay. You need to be small. So there was that. Um, what else? I know there's more. But like, those are the ones that, oh, being bossy. Oh, I hate that one. You know, I hate that one. Yeah. Um, but from such a young age, again, I was always told that I was so bossy because I always wanted to be the leader. I always wanted to be in charge. And I always had a very clear idea of like, okay, this is what I want to do. Here's the plan. I know how to execute it. 
Those are great qualities to have, but because I was a young little girl, I was told instead that I was being too bossy. When in fact, those are like, like in, in a little boy, you don't say that to a little boy. You don't say like, oh wow, you're being too, you're being too bossy by taking charge. You tell him like, great, you're gonna be a great CEO or whatever the fuck. You know, and, but like, oh, a little girl, like, oh, you're being too bossy. You need to let other people, like, I don't know, be in charge. They don't want to be in charge. Who cares if I want to be in charge? You know, so just like stuff like that. And so little things like that when you're, when you're young, you know, you create these subconscious beliefs that like you can't, you can't do certain things or be a certain way when you get older and that's when you run into trouble. You know, that's when you have a hard time doing some of the things that you want to do because you feel like you can't because that's like n not the type of person that you're allowed to be. And so I feel like that's where so many people in life start to stop like pursuing the things that they really want because they're afraid. They're afraid of like, oh, what are other people going to think or what, you know, what, what kind of person does that make me or like, oh, that's too risky or like whatever. And, and then you end up falling into that or like doing things that are like safe. And, and so that's kind of like this. So that's where this whole thing from like, oh, it, it, mommy, am I being a good girl sort of comes from and how, how that can tie into relationships, right? And, <clears throat> and so then if you're too scared to like be yourself or go for things that you want, then that can include your relationship or the, the type of relationship that you want. Yeah. I was thinking how, so like. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like how do you, losing how, my, my thread here. How do you think it would be a better way for a parent to go about like teaching their kids like, you know, kind behavior and, and morality without like, it's, you know, pigeonholing them into like one way of thinking? Well, I mean, you can teach people to be kind without like like those are so separate to me like okay yeah if if like a little kid hits another little kid of course you're gonna tell them like no you can't do that you can't hit another person but I'm that's not what I'm talking about I'm like these aren't moral things that I'm talking about I'm, I'm talking about I was loud as a child no, I'm, I'm I like to the, be in charge I'm talking about the good girl part like yeah yeah, so like, like those are separate though. You know, it's like that. Like that's what you tell a dog when it does something good. Oh, good girl. Oh, what a good girl, you little dog. So it's like, I don't know. I'm like, this is a child who has like thoughts and feelings and wants and dreams and desires, and you're, you're like snuffing that out by being like, no, you have to be a certain way. Okay, I. I kind of see where I think what what you're assuming might be a little different than what I'm assuming but you're saying like you know like you were you were thinking that when this this parent said like or when the little girl asked her parent they were being a good girl did you assume that like the parent was kind of being controlling and having them only like want to behave in a certain way and the kid was seeking like validation for behaving in this one particular way yeah that's what I said okay <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's hard to draw that conclusion exactly for me. Like, you know, it was, well, I guess the whole reason the kid was maybe asking that question is because they were constantly told, like, oh, you're, you're not behaving properly. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to behave like this. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there is, maybe the parent was kind of trying to slightly over control their child. I yeah. I don't know. It's hard, like it's hard to make, like, exact assumptions based on, like, one one incident but I see what you're saying okay but that's not like the the whole point of like what exactly was going on in that moment with his daughter and child like that 
or mother and daughter. Like that's that's not the point because we of course we don't know. We saw the them walking through the airport for like two seconds. The point was that whole like idea and mentality of of like teaching children or teaching women especially but men too to like act a certain way and be a certain way like like okay what about like when a little boy cries how many times have we heard like oh man up don't cry man up you know and so that's teaching boys not to feel their emotions not to express their emotions right it's like that same it's like the concept I'm not I'm not talking about like this specific moment with this in the airport like that's whatever like that that's not the point the point is the yeah. whole concept no i know i'm just trying to think of like to me it seems almost like this is this is more so like talking about parenting but i guess it does affect you know as you're saying like your beliefs and your behaviors when you grow up but you know you definitely want to give your your child enough like autonomy and freedom to make their own decisions even yeah. like at a young age, yeah, or even like question them, being like, you know, if that if that little girl was like, oh, mommy, am I being a good girl? And you'd be like, well, do you think you're being a good girl? Mm-hmm. Like you can ask them back. So like, you know, I mean, kids are like, how kids are just like so smart at such a young age. <laughs> they are. It's interesting to, to see like how they answer that question. Yeah, because it's like I feel like they're so naturally intuitive. Exactly. At such a young age. And it'd be interesting. So, yeah, instead of, like, trying to control them the exact way you want them to be, you know, it's a balance. You want to guide them to be, like, a kind person, but you also want to give them freedom to kind of explore their own, I guess, beliefs and their own viewpoints. Yeah. Even at that young of an age. Yeah, So it's, de- a, it's definitely. a balancing act. Yeah. You don't want to give them freedom to, like, do whatever they want and, like... <laughs> Maybe just grow up like thinking they can do whatever they want, because that could. Well, no, of course not. But like that's that's but you not also the don't point. Don't want to like completely control. This is about this isn't about parenting. That's not. But it also, but it affects the child and how they grow up. Yeah. And like it's affected. It's affected everybody. Yeah. You know, one way or another. Yeah. Well, it's it's societal conditioning. Yeah. Like that. That's what we're really talking about. Yeah. And then. Also, just being like socially constrained to gender norms mm-hmm. when you're when you're young. Yeah, you know it's like nowadays. It's I think it's a lot more open, a mm-hmm. lot more flexible. But when we were growing up, and definitely like our parents' childhood. Yeah. Back in when the heck was that? Probably seventies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seventies. I think maybe 60s, for your 70s. maybe for your mom. Yeah, say fifties and seventies. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> they were like clearly defined gender norms back then. Yeah. So yeah, it's like getting looser and looser. Yeah. Well, and and that's the thing. Like I think we're we're finally starting to see some of those structures sort of like break, and and people aren't wanting to conform to that. And I mean, obviously, with like women going back to work and all that kind of stuff, like that that has helped change things. And but now we're seeing that like. Yeah, like it, like so much more, like gender, like having to conform to like those gender roles. Like, I don't feel like that's really a thing very much anymore, at least not here in like California or LA. Um, maybe in other parts of the countries, right? Or country. Um, but yeah, it, 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 like it's more about like the societal conditioning that we we are all brought up with and that we're all trying to like break and say is this really right for me or is it just what I was told was right yeah I think that's I think that's why a lot of people have midlife crises crises is crises yeah what I'm gonna call it <laughs> Cause yeah they've been on this like this one path their whole life of like what you know what they've been told is right and they've just stayed on that path without really like experimenting or venturing off of it mm-hmm. and there's your point where they're like wow is this like really what i want yeah and so yeah i feel like it's just so important to like always to like constantly be asking yourself like what do i want and also i think it's important to figure out like why like why do you want this too mm-hmm. like to me that's the hard part like what you want is like 
I feel like that's like the first step. It's it's pretty easy to like figure out like I have this desire like that I want to fulfill. Yeah. But like digging down deeper as to like why you want that, that's when you'll really like start learning things and discovering things about yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then yeah, that's I think that's when when you realize like, hey, like what I've been told, you know, I may not want or may not believe. So I might want to like experiment or, or try something new and different. Mm-hmm. But I think everyone, at some point in their lives, you know, whether it's like a rebellious teenager or like someone going through a midlife crisis, like they're constantly asking themselves that or trying to figure it out. Like, what do I want? And why do I want that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The why is what's really important. And yeah, you're exactly right. Once you start asking the why and you keep digging down, like, further and further and further that's when you find those like subconscious beliefs and those patterns and those um like societal beliefs is that right yeah yeah like that's when you find those things and you realize like oh I don't actually want this I've just been conditioned to think that I do yeah, I remember a big one for me in college was like, why, like, why am I trying so hard in school? Mm-hmm. Like, my mom had always pushed me to do well in school, and like now I'm, I'm pretty happy she did. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm definitely happy she did, but you know, I, I feel like, I guess I wish I, I would have like branched out in other areas of life a little earlier. But mm-hmm. yeah, I remember being in college, and I was just like so tired and stressed after, like, one of my like harder engineering quarters and I was like why am I like putting myself through all this like you know like I I know this is like supposed to be good for me for my future but is this really what I want Mm -hmm. and so like that was like kind of the first time I like really questioned a path that like before was just so obvious and so already set yeah and so then yeah I was like you know like I thought about other careers or like other you know, things to do with my life, and I was like, you know what, like, I, at the end of the day, like, I do enjoy this, and I feel like it, it is, like, beneficial for me in the future, and I can see myself doing it my whole life, so. Yeah. Like, yeah, I do want to stick with engineering, but, yeah, I've definitely, like, had moments definitely caused, like, like, definitely, like, induced by a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. That made me, like, really dig in deeper, like, to my core beliefs, and, like, why I was really doing something. Yeah. Yeah, then you can extend that to, like, you know, not just school or, like, work, but, like, you can extend it to, like, monogamy, dating, Mm -hmm. your gender even. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, that's becoming a lot, you know, more and more common. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, I think that's, I think it's important to do to, like, have a a strong self-awareness and a a strong self-identity. Mm-hmm. Like, really understand, like, who you are and, like, why you want to be that person. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of people who choose something other than monogamy <clears throat> have had to go through this, you know? Like, clearly, they they had to realize that monogamy wasn't working for them, and so they had to reevaluate and say, okay, well, then, what do I want? if I don't want monogamy or like why, why isn't monogamy working for me? What is it that I want that's different and why, why do I want that? And so it, it it does to, to go like off of the path that is normal. It does take like a certain level of self-awareness and some of that digging, like we talked about, to decide to sort of step off the path, the beaten path, as they say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to, like, define why you no longer want to be monogamous. Yeah. Like, what, you know, what is it that you're going to gain? But also, like, what are, like, the risks or what are, like, you know, the other the other factors involved with not being monogamous? Yeah. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a personal choice for everybody. And, you know, I feel like most people probably just don't even ask themselves that question. They just, 
they want to be monogamous and that's that's totally fine that's their goal yeah but yeah i guess we've just been a little more questioning and a little more experimental <laughs> uh, yeah well yeah exactly it, questioning and and looking and just saying like is this right for me is this working for me that's kind of what we've done yeah so then we wanted to sort of extend that into this idea of like being like a good wife or a good husband right because I feel like I don't know I feel like I see this a lot. It's like, like okay, like I'm I'm married now, and and now we have the house, and we're having the kids, and I'm I'm being this this perfect, this perfect wife. But like, but again, like what what does that really mean, you know? And like again, I think it kind of goes back to like gender norms of like, I don't know, like playing playing a role when like it's not really necessary, or it might not actually fit you but you feel like you have to fit yourself into that box so we kind of wanted to talk about like what what do we think makes like a, a good wife or a good husband or really just like a good partner in general or but in like a, a polyamorous relationship yeah I mean I think I think what makes a good partner is, you know, pretty similar to, to what makes a good partner in a monogamous relationship. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess, I mean, we, we talk a lot about just like being always like open and always communicating with one another. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's, that's very important in a monogamous relationship too, but I feel like it's, just, it's like vital if you want to be in a polyamorous relationship. Yeah. That that works and that lasts. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, I mean, you're just, like, you're living your life, you know, with other partners, so. Yeah. Like, you have to keep your primary partner always, always in the loop and always up to date with what you're thinking and feeling. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I don't know if we can stress enough that, like, communication and honesty are, like, key absolutely key yeah like otherwise it's not this just wouldn't work yeah 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 i mean you lose trust you'd also like you wouldn't be on the same page mm -hmm. there could be bitterness and anger so yeah yeah that's to me that's just like that's the clear number one yeah um i think you also have to be you just have to be open and, and supportive to like your partner's desires and pursuits too. Mm -hmm. Like I think if you try to get too possessive or too controlling, um, or even like you know too jealous, that's when like that's when there's definitely going to be friction between between you and your partner. Yeah. So, but yeah, then like that's where like obviously the communication and and the transparency come in. Yeah. So you guys can talk about like what you want. Mm -hmm. but I feel like as long as each person is like clearly communicating like what their needs are and whether they're being met or not then then you know there's there should be like flexibility within within your schedules and also just within your partnership to like to see other people yeah so yeah I mean that's that's a huge one yeah also because if you're just kind of like I feel like if you're just a controlling or possessive person you know, especially as a guy, like if you're like, oh, she's mine, <laughs> and only mine, then like, yeah, this, yeah. like your your natural tendency to want that is is gonna completely conflict with being polyamorous, and it's just not gonna work. Yeah, but again, like I think, I think those those feelings of like possessiveness that comes from like a lack mentality, and I think we've talked about this a little bit on on one of the episodes previous, probably the jealousy one. But, <clears throat> but like really, if, if you're being super possessive or controlling over someone else, it's, it's because of, of a feeling of lack within your own self, 
right? And and so you feel like, well, if I can just if I can just control these other things and like hold on to them, then everything will be okay and whatever is happening within you because you you feel like you can't control something, so you're going to control the thing you feel like you can control, which is the other person. Which I mean, really you can't, right? None of us can control anyone other than ourselves. But so that's yeah. that's sort of like where that comes from is that lack mentality of of being afraid of like losing this person or, or losing this, this thing that you have and never being able to get it back. That's yeah. really where, where that comes from. So it's like when, when those t- kinds of feelings start to come up, then it's really like looking within and saying like, Oh, okay. So then <clears throat> if this is what I'm feeling, then what, why it always comes back to the why. <laughs> like really we were talking does. before it always comes back to why and I feel like that's that's actually something we do with each other very often when one of us is is feeling a certain way or or maybe we're angry or we're upset about something w- whether it has to do with each other or not it could be about something else I feel like we're, we're getting really good at saying like okay but why Okay, and then you get the answer, and then okay, but why? Yeah, and like, or, like, and, or be more specific, or like, you know, uh-huh. or like elaborate more, or like dig deeper into that. Yeah, yeah, and we've gotten really good at that, and it's been so helpful because then we can get sort of to like that that root, the root of of what is really happening. And at the end of the day, it always comes back to something within our own selves, even if we're upset with somebody else. It always comes down to you know, something within us. Yeah. That's funny. I just, I thought of like a, it's kind of like a nerdy engineering. Yay. (laughs) No, because there's a, a, there's a related concept in engineering. I think it's, I think it's called, um, it's in the, like the failure. uh, What is it? I think it's called FMEA, like failure modes and effects analysis. Like one of the ways to determine the root cause of any failure of a piece of equipment is, they call it like the five whys. No. I think, I think it originated, <laughs> it was either from Ford or it might have been like like some like Japanese manufacturer. I can't remember exactly. I, I just like skimmed it, skimmed across this information. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, con- this, the concept is, is very similar, practically the same. It's like to determine the root cause of why, of, or, you know, the source of why something failed or how it failed is you ask five whys. Mm-hmm. So you start with, like, the simplest thing, like, I don't know, what what's, like, okay, say, like, a, you have a pipe in your house and, it like, it corroded through and, I don't know, it, it like, burst. Mm-hmm. If it's pressurized, let's say. And so, like, you know, you just you just ask why. Okay, so, like, this pipe is lying here in pieces, like, you know, like why, like why could this have potentially happened? So then you like, mm-hmm. you lay out reasons. Oh, there's corrosion. Oh, like there's an increase in pressure. And it's like, you, you just keep laying out your reasons. Um, but then like, you can also like look at like how the part failed and like, Oh, like why did it form like this failure surface? Or like, why did it break like this? Mm-hmm. And so if you like dig deep enough and like you ask enough questions, it's not always five, but that's just like the rule of thumb. Yeah. Yeah. And you keep asking why. And if you're able to like, evaluate each one and analyze each question each why and answer it you should be able to trace you know the failure the cause of the failure back yeah to its source so so it's the same thing <laughs> it's yeah, literally it's, it's the, the same, same exact, thing that we were saying yeah this is just applied to <clears throat> your beliefs yeah your own like emotions and and beliefs and what is what is happening yeah Yeah. Yeah. Cause sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to explain. You're feeling something and you're like, "Ah, I don't, I don't know how to explain what it is that I'm feeling. And I don't really know why I'm feeling this, you know? And And if you feel like, if you feel like you're, you know, you're failing like quote unquote, like you're like system overload (laughs) or you're you're constantly, you're constantly repeating the same behaviors, even though you don't want to. Yeah. And like, they're, you know, they're not like leaning to anything positive for you. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you can like, keep asking why and keep trying to figure out like you know what's the reason I'm doing this yeah because it's like you can you can realize like this is like not what I want to do but like Mm -hmm. that may not be enough of like 
know, it might not be like a deep enough like change or like a strong enough like yeah like behavioral force to like get you to like truly act differently you yeah. might have to like dig a lot deeper until you like can kind of figure out like a core a core cause of that yeah yeah totally I get that I I feel like that's that's something I really struggle with um sometimes it's like it's like why like why like I want to make this change but why can't I do it right and then it's exactly that you ask all of the whys and then you get to that core belief of like oh this is why it's so hard to like make this change because it's some stupid bullshit belief from when I was five and now I'm like okay now I have to work on that yeah (laughs) it's the hard part with like changing a belief too is you like constantly have to be like yeah, it's not easy. Recognizing it and like trying to change it yeah. until it like until the new belief sticks in your head. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's even like more difficult because like if you're dealing with like a a piece of equipment, like all you have to do is like replace it. Yeah. It's just it's a mechanical component that you can easily replace usually. Yeah. And then you're you're done. Your problem's fixed. But yeah, when it comes to your own beliefs, it takes a lot more dedication, a lot more <laughs> <laughs> a lot more time, and just, yeah, a lot more effort. Yeah. To, like, truly change it. Yeah, and, like, some people just don't even want to, don't even want to put in the work, you know? They realize, like, oh, shit, I need to make this change, but, like, the work that it requires, like, okay, we're, like, it's totally, I feel like we're getting on a tangent, but whatever. It's, like, I feel like sometimes people, like, they go to the doctor, and the doctor tells them, all you have to do is switch your diet and you'll be fine, right? Like stop eating like this, this, and this, these three things, and you'll be fine. I mean, basically, right? Okay, this is a pretend scenario. But then they'll be like, what? You want me to cut out what? And they won't do it. And, you know, it's like it's like that kind of, it's like that same thing. It's like, you realize what it is you need to do, but you're not willing to put in the work. And so it's like, then did you really want to change it all? You know, like once you found out what it took to make that change, you're like, oh, no, that's too much. Then I guess you didn't really want to make the change, did you? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot more mental work, a lot more stress. Yeah. It's a lot of, yeah, it's it's just easier to be like complacent and lazy. It is. And just stay on you know, the path that you've always been on. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I was also going to say another thing about, um, it's like circling back to like, you know, a guy being possessive. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's definitely, I feel like a, a good part of it is a lack mentality, but there's also, I feel like there's also like a power dynamic too. Mm. It's like the man wanting to be like the dominant one, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, like going back to the caveman days, like, oh, she's mine. <laughs> I, I must, like, capture her and take her back to the cave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's – I feel like it's both. So I feel like a lot of guys to, like, feel like – to feel like a man or to feel, like, dominant, they want, like, that – they want to be, like, the one in charge. They want to be, like – they want to have that power mm-hmm. and that influence. And so, yeah, I guess that's one way, like, to be, like, possessive and to, like, try to, like, control – a woman, I guess, like, to them, like, you know, that might, that might make them feel powerful. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we've seen that all throughout history, right? Like, hello, patriarchy. Yeah. (laughs) Like, controlling other people, mostly women, it makes you feel, makes men feel powerful. Like, hello, how many times have we seen that played out in history? A bazillion, and we're over that now, right? Well, I mean, some of us are over it, but... (laughs) <laughs> well yeah clearly as a society though we're not well exactly that's what i mean <laughs> yeah. like as a society we're still kind of working on that one um but yeah yeah that's that's very true but then again it's like the asking of the why like why do you need why do you need to feel powerful why do you need to dominate over someone else in order to feel powerful is it because you don't feel powerful? Most likely. Why is that? You know, and then asking those questions, again, the why, 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 until you get to the bottom of it. 
Yeah. I mean, I feel like, well, I think, I don't know. I haven't done the research, but I feel like some of it might be just like biological and evolutionary. But there's also, but yeah, like, I don't know. I don't know if that's like entirely true or if that's just well, kind of like. Well, but that is. That that is like that's that's one of the things that we're learning with um oh shoot what is it called the the science of like oh my god why can't I think of it um the science of of looking at like um like your genes and and the traits that are that have been passed down um like that that's like a real thing now that we like know like, like genotyping or. No, ah, oh, shoot. I, oh my God. What's it called? What's it called? Um, I can't remember right now. Yeah. But it's like, <laughs> it's like newer. Like we've talked about it before. God, I feel like I need to look, look this up right now. It's going to bother me. <laughs> um... I guess also you, you need to decide as a person, like, is this, like, biological programming? Like, how how do I, like, how do I want to this to play out in my life, like, in a more, like, in my social life, too? Like, yeah. How, like, you know, you're, like, you have to, I guess, decide to what degree, like, you want that to be a part of your life. Like, do you always have to be dominant in every, like, social situation? Are you always 100% competitive and, like always trying to win and, and just, like, you know, dominate all your opponents? Like, is everyone an opponent to you? Like, do you feel, like, threatened by everyone? Yeah. So, you know, you have to <laughs> determine, like, to which degree, like, is that beneficial for you in our modern-day society? Yeah. So. But, yeah, I mean, there is, you know, there's, there's definitely, like, an attractiveness to it, like, to being – to having a certain amount of power and influence for sure. Yeah. Definitely in terms of like money and, and just like social status. Yeah, but then again, you have to ask, well, why is that important to you? Yeah. Why why is that important? Is it important because you feel like that's the only way to truly succeed because we live in this like capitalistic world or is that truly what you want? And if yeah. you do, why? Why do you want that? What is it? What What are you going to do with it? Are you going to do good or are you going to do bad? Yeah. You know, like what? I, mean, I think it's just fulfilling a, a fundamental need of someone to just like want to be seen or feel important. Yeah. And that's like everybody has that to some degree. But how they like play it out is different. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are very content like, you know, being like a part of, you know, like having a family and being like a part of their community. Yeah. Uh, that makes them feel like important within that world of theirs. Yeah. So, and yeah, that's a personal decision that everyone has to make. Yeah, and I think I think that's great. Like, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that, right? To say like, all I need is to have have my family and support my community. Boom. I'm gonna live a wonderful life. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, some people just some people are you know are greedier and they want more. Okay, but I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily want to say greedier, right? Because there's nothing wrong with wanting more if the intentions behind it are good. So I, I wouldn't yeah. necessarily want to call that greedy because that, that puts a negative connotation on wanting more and yeah. there's nothing wrong with wanting well, it's, yeah. more. It's a very subjective term. It's yeah. Like, how do you like quantify greed? Is it like a certain amount of money? I like guess it's just so difficult to I like that that's like so subjective to each individual. Yeah. Probably based on your your moral or religious upbringing. Yeah. And that's so. that's why I wouldn't want to say it, it's greedy to want more because it's not. It yeah. it depends on why you want more and what what are you going to do with that more yeah. when you get it. You know, so it's not I wouldn't want to label that as greedy. Yeah. True. Feel like we went off on a really big tangent. <laughs> <laughs> it is related, but <laughs> no, I mean it definitely was, um, and I, I feel like it was it was good to talk about. Yeah, well, I mean, the original question was like, what do we feel like makes a good 
spouse. Oh, wow. Yeah, we got really off topic, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's we'll take, okay. We'll take a few uh, turns. Yeah. Hey, there's nothing <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with taking a few turns because I think it, it's also important. Again, we, we're just expressing our own thoughts and opinions and beliefs on the subject and we're taking up the space, right? Like I was saying earlier. Um, but yeah, no, it branched out from the whole like, you know, like being like open and flexible and supportive and like not being dominant or possessive. Yeah. So I mean, that was, Oh yeah. That was damn. Really that was a while ago. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Is there anything, anything else? Did you want to add anything to that? Um, well, I think the, like the honesty and the communication obviously are like huge <clears throat> And in being able to like trust your partner, and because I mean, if you can't trust your partner, then then you don't have a partnership anymore, right? Um, and being willing to compromise, <laughs> your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Mike likes to joke that I have just learned how to compromise. <laughs> Not true, but. I mean, it's not true, but there is some truth to it. <laughs> <laughs> How is there some truth to it? <laughs> I mean, it's just, you like getting your way. Yeah. What's wrong with that? <laughs> everyone likes to get their way, right? Yeah. That That's just, everyone likes that. Yeah, but sometimes, you know, you're fighting so hard to get your way that you're not seeing a path to compromise. Uh... I mean, I, <laughs> am I? Usually we do compromise, but it's just. No, I know. You're a little more so like that than I am, so it's just. Uh, I just like to joke about it. I know. <laughs> it's just something for me to, to pick on you for. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I know what I want and I go for it. It's like I said about the bossy thing. Even when I was like five, I was like, this is what I want. This is how I'm going to do it. Go. And it's still true today. And yeah. So do I like to get my way? Yes. Do I try as hard as I possibly can to get as close to my way as possible? Most of the time. But we do compromise. And yeah, we always come we to a solution to. that makes us both happy. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm just really good at coming up with like creative solutions to problems or ideas. Yeah, you are. So that way we can both be happy. And I can still get my way. <laughs> they usually lean in your favor, but they are, I feel like they are creative and thoughtful enough where it's like, at least somewhat, it's enough of a compromise for me to be okay with it. Yeah. It also depends on how big of a deal the issue is, but I mean. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have to get into those specifics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't need to get into all of that. But again, like still compromise is important. And so even though we like to joke that I... But really, I, I am really good at compromise, if you think about it, because I, I'm always saying like, okay, well, what if we do this or this or this and right coming up with those like creative solutions. So that way we can both be happy. Yeah. So really, I am very good at it, or at least good at coming up with different ways to compromise. It's just, you know, maybe it's, it's not always like, I'm not always like, fine, we'll do 50, 50, whatever. But that's not life. Who does that? Like, that's not normal. Yeah. I mean, or just allowing the other person to, like, get their way. What? This time. And then, <laughs> you know, next time you'll get what you want. Or just, you know, something like that. It doesn't have to always be like. Or why can't we just both get what we want? I mean, yeah, it depends. It depends <laughs> on the specific situation. But... Uh, now I'm picking on you. <laughs> You do like to fight for, like, getting as close to your way as possible, though. I do. I do. You'll rarely ever be like, okay, like, you have your way. I'll have my way next time. You're just, I mean, you're just like a, you're just, a, you're just fiery like that. You always <laughs> like to, you always like to fight. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. But again, there's nothing wrong with that. No. Ooh. <laughs> Excuse me. 
uh, okay. So yeah, I think those are kind of the only <clears throat> the only other things I would add to like being a good partner, right? And then that's just like in any relationship, you know, you have to have all of those things. Communication, honesty, trust, knowing how to compromise, listening to each other. Yeah, so maybe it's not like you need any like new trait. Yeah. It's just you have to have you have to be strong in those like those important traits. Yeah. To make it work. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you're gonna be trying to make it work with multiple people, then yeah, you have to be really strong in those areas. Because otherwise, it's just going to be too hard. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, I think this is a good place to... End it? Call it an episode. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. This is a, a little bit of a longer one, surprisingly. Dang. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's because we went off to, on that giant tangent. Yeah. It's a little detour. Oh, uh, yeah. Took the scenic route. <laughs> we did. We took the scenic route on this one. All right, that is it for this episode. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening every week. Your su support um, really means the world to us. So some little exciting news. We are ranked in Apple Podcasts now. Yay! Um, yeah, so we're ranked in the relationship category, so that's super exciting. So if you want to keep supporting us, please rate our podcast, um, subscribe to the podcast, and share it with somebody. If there's an episode that you really like in particular and you feel like it could help somebody that you know or spark an interesting conversation with a friend or a loved one, send it to them. Share this podcast. Spread the love. Um, but anyway, as usual, please, please, please subscribe and rate our podcast. It would really mean the world to us. And if you want to reach out to us um, and chat with us, you can find me on Instagram. My handle is at underscore alisa.janelle. And if you have any questions for Mike, you can reach out to me there. And of course, the question will make its way over to him and he will answer. Um, or you can send us an email at poly plus amore equals us, the number eight at gmail.com. Um, so if you prefer email, shoot us an email and we will get back to you. All right, that is it for this week. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next week.